everyone to this Wondergart session on fermenting and why you might want it in your life. My name is Jo Webster and I run wondergot.com from the city of Wells. I became interested in fermenting about six years ago when I realised that microbes are this intervening factor between our health, the health of our soil, the health of our vegetables, the health of our earth and us with it. And I realised this amazing thing that they're intimately connected to our health, but unlike our genes, they are alterable. We can alter the microbes that are in us to better support our health, our mental health, our physical health and our emotional health. And that blew my mind a little bit. But not only that, fermented foods taste magnificent and they help us preserve vegetables um, and produce from the summer through the winter when we need those nutrients and can't get them from our garden in the same way. So today I am delighted to have a slot at Wells Virtual Food Festival to show you how to do this yourself. It is easy, there are some simple practical rules to maintain safety and once you've seen me make this tomato salsa you will know what those basic rules are to be able to do, um, to make your own ferments from a range of vegetables. It's not just about cabbage. So what is fermentation? Fermentation is a process by which microbes break down sugars, sometimes proteins and other things too, but sugars in foods. And in doing so, they produce a very small amount of ethanol, alcohol, some carbon dioxide, certainly initially, which is a lot of bubbling, but also the means by which we manage the process encourages the growth of a lot of lactobacillus bacteria, and they produce lactic acid. So that the, the process of fermentation is in a way controlled decomposition and it is very very similar to the process that's happening in our large intestine the last bit of our gut leading down to our anus so what we get to see when we're fermenting vegetables is a mirror to, to some extent of what's happening inside our guts and this process to me is completely magical because you can't see them but on these vegetables are microbes there's klebsiella there's e coli not the dangerous kind generally. There is Leuconostoc mesenteroides, there is Lactobacillus plantarum, there's all sorts of microbes on here. And what we're going to do, what I'm going to show you how to do is create an environment where those microbes thrive and they go through a range of there being a broad range of microbes and then as the lactobacillus produce that lactic acid the environment becomes more acidic and the, and the microbes that like acid less start to die down and those lactic acid bacteria start to thrive and take over and as a result of that a number of things happen firstly what you put into your ferment is utterly transformed into something vibrant and tangy and um, more bioavailable for your digestive system. So not only does it make the nutrients in these vegetables more available to us to, to absorb, but also we get a plethora of beneficial microbes taking over and we consume those too. So as a result of fermentation, we get transformed vegetables in a new and novel taste that just doesn't taste the same as how they were before. We get more accessible nutrients and we get a load of probiotic microbes with us. And when we're, when we're working with vegetables in this way, we get fibre, prebiotic fibre, which is fibre that when we eat it and it, it can't be absorbed in our small intestine, we do not have the enzymes to break down fibre. It gets to our large intestine because we can't absorb it and it feeds the microbes living in our gut. And those microbes break down that fiber. Not only do they provide, make those nutrients more available to us in our large intestine, but they also produce a, a dazzling array 
of metabolites, so byproducts from this fermentation process. Now the list is gigantic and slightly mind-blowing, but one of the main things they produce are a range of short-chain fatty acids, and they feed the cells lining our gut, our enterocytes. So those short-chain fatty acids help to support the lining of our gut. And of course, that is a crucial interface with the outside world. Um, we have a huge amount of immune system in our gut um, and we have a huge amount of nervous system in our gut. So those um, short-chain fatty, acid, fatty acids are helping to maintain that gut lining nice and healthy, not inflamed and doing its job of, of deciding what's going through that barrier into our blood and our lymphatic system and what isn't. So that is a crucial role, especially because we now know that more and more um, illnesses, cancers, um, dementia, diabetes, atherosclerosis, all sorts of things are being linked with an inflammatory process and more and more people are beginning to think this process begins in our gut. So not only short chain fatty acids, would you believe it, they produce dopamine, they produce serotonin, so they produce neurotransmitters, they produce brain derived neurotrophic factor, they produce all sorts of things that our body needs. And in fact, what we're coming to understand is a lot of our internal processes have been outsourced to microbes. So there's, for example, as I said, the enzyme to break down fiber, we don't have it, we rely on our microbes to do it for us. Um, in fact, there's good evidence that the mitochondria inside our cells, which are the absolute powerhouse that produce our energy for us, were once microbes that we've brought into our system to help us. So in this simple, pleasurable process to make delicious food, we are mirroring a process that originates inside us, which keeps us connected with how we're part of a circle. It makes the nutrients more bioavailable to us. It enriches our system with beneficial microbes as we're um, eating them. And it is really, really good fun. And what I have found personally is, it reminds me that I'm part of something bigger. And I think it's really interesting with the COVID-19 um, stuff happening that we see viruses, we see microbes as a problem. There will be more viruses after COVID-19 and if we just sit back and rely on a vaccine we aren't doing all of the other things we could be doing to support our health and to build our understanding of how our existence and our health is a continuum with these microbes. They were here before us, they will be here afterwards. They are pretty much everywhere and if we can support them through fun things that connect us to our vegetables and to our natural environment to reinforce our place in that circle, I think it's a no-brainer. So I'm going to show you now just how easy this process is and what the simple safety um, checks are to make sure you are making the perfect environment for the beneficial bacteria to thrive. And at the end of it, you will have a tomato salsa that will blow your mind. And what I would really like you to remember is this is not only for tomato salsa or it's not only for cabbage. Most things that contain carbohydrate, that contain sugary stuff can be fermented. I fermented mushrooms, I fermented garlic buds, I fermented nasturtium capers. It is the most wonderful rabbit hole to fall down that will be very enjoyable, but also support your health. So. Let me show you how to make tomato salsa. This is one of my favorite fermenting recipes and it is from my friend Dervla Reynolds who wrote uh, The Cultured Club and she made up this recipe and it is an absolute corker. The thing that I love about it is that it can, um, it's ready in four or five days if you want to eat it that quickly, if you can't wait, but equally if you leave it for longer it um, matures in the most exotic fashion. So I normally have to have a couple on the go so that I can eat one straight away and leave one for longer. So what you're gonna need, and again, what I do wanna emphasize with fermenting that there aren't any strict rules. Generally the ingredients is cheap. So please feel free to experiment. Um, you can tune into your sense of smell, um, 
look at things. If things don't look or smell right, you will know pretty quickly. But I have probably in the five or six years I've been doing it, I've only had one ferment that hasn't worked. So trust your instincts and play. So whilst um, Dervla and I use these ingredients, you can tweak it. So we've got a couple of peppers, onion. I tend to go for red onion because the red represents more flavonoids in it than white onion. So I like to use the red onion, um, some coriander, and we need a couple of cloves of garlic, Ooh. the juice of a lemon, um, tomatoes, obviously. I um, tend to use eight or so tomatoes. These ones aren't huge, so I might use a bit more today and um, some cumin seeds. And I've also picked from the garden, which isn't in the original recipe, some thyme. So I'm also training in medical herbalism at the moment and I'm exploring using medicinal herbs in my ferments. Now thyme is a fantastic herb packed with essential oils. I can smell them, but you can't um, at the moment. And um, they are profound antimicrobials, which sounds, like a bit bizarre that I'm putting them in a ferment where I want microbes to grow. But these uh, thyme is really good at preventing problematic bacteria growing and particularly in our respiratory system. So chucking some of that in my ferment felt like a good idea today. And some salt. Now I use Malden sea salt. Um, it doesn't really matter what sort of salt you use. Some people like to use Himalayan salt. Um, I don't tend to use common garden table salt because it tends to have quite a few packers in it or bulking agents. Um, so I like sea salt. Now, what the salt will do, as you will see in a minute, is draw out the moisture from the vegetables, break down the cell walls, but it also interacts with the um, constituents of the cell walls to keep your vegetables crispy. And no one really tends to like a soggy ferment. So, um, and salt is also antimicrobial, so it prevents um, problematic bacteria um, getting involved. So the first thing we're gonna do is chop some onion. And one of the key things to fermenting is chopping things up reasonably small. So the reason that we're doing that is to increase the surface area available to the microbes for breaking down the sugars that they want access to. So reasonably small surface area is important. Now the only vegetable that I don't tend to do this with is beetroot because there is such a high sugar content. If you cut it really, really small, everything goes a little bit crazy and um, the outcome isn't always very nice. But with most vegetables, nice small chunks means that you're making it easy as possible for those microbes to get access. Now the other thing that I'm gonna do just before I start is weigh my bowl because other than small surface area, another important factor is percentage salt. So I always add 2% salt, which I promise is gonna be the only mass that you have to do in this, but it means I need to know the weight of my vegetables at the end. So, we're gonna put in the onion, and then we're gonna cut up our Pepper, you can use green pepper, yellow pepper, uh, whatever's available to you. Take the seeds out. Cut them up. And pepper's obviously part of the capsicum family. So you've got lots of beneficial herbal constituents in here. Tastes marvellous. Smells pretty amazing as well. Get those in there. Obviously, if you don't like pepper, you don't have to put pepper in. I can't emphasise enough how, how much in teaching this, humans want to get things 
right, whatever that means. Um, and actually experimenting and finding out the results is one of the things that I love most about fermentation. Uh, I could probably call myself a little bit of a control freak and fermenting foods has really helped with that because you're not 100% in control of the process. So you get to do some stuff and find out what happens depending on what the microbes do, how warm your room is. Um, yeah, so in terms of variables, you've got the surface area that you provide will affect the rate of fermentation. The warmth of your room, so I normally have my ferments in my kitchen or I've got a ferment cupboard in the corner of my room and um, that's at normal room temperature, sort of 20, 21 degrees. You'll find if the temperature goes up, things will happen much faster. And if the temperature goes down, microbial activity will slow. So when your ferment is ready, which is based on what your taste buds tell you, you can put your ferment in the fridge and the um, fermentation process won't stop, but it will slow right, right down. So temperature is a factor and time is a factor too. So normally, Within about four to five days of most ferments, we will be th through what's called the heterofermentative stage. Now that's the stage where you've got a wide range of microbes and they're producing um, a wide, a lot of carbon dioxide. So you know when bubbling stops um, that you're through that, that stage where there's lots of different microbes in action. And once you've got through that, you know that the lactobacillus style microbes have, have won the war. Well, not a war, but uh, won the, they've, they've produced an environment that they thrive in um, by producing that lactic acid. And so that normally happens after sort of four to five days, which means any time from then you can start eating your ferment. But um, it's definitely worth leaving some longer to see what happens in this sort of controlled decomposition, which is what fermenting is. So that's so you've got surface area, you've got time, temperature, and the amount of salt will have a factor uh, have an effect too. But I normally just keep that at, at two percent. Um, yeah. If you're doing brines, sometimes you can do um, things whole, like um, little dill uh, pickled cucumbers, and then you're adding salt water into the, um, into the process over whole vegetables, but that's, that's probably a whole different session. So, the important thing that I have really noticed is that people have very different taste buds and they like ferments at very different stages. So some people will uh, like this ferment after five days, some people will like it after five months. And the truth is that this um, form of pres preservation will keep uh, your ferment edible for years. So these preserved lemons, for example, um, I made in March, 2019 and they're still good to go and I think even this um, sauerkraut I actually made at Wells Food Festival a few years ago now as part of our Guinness World Record breaking um, event and we did set the first ever Guinness World Record for the largest dish of bacterially fermented sauerkraut so this is at least two years old and they just develop in the most incredible way so let your taste buds be your guide uh, for you to decide when your ferment is ready and the other thing that i would say is that sort of societally we've kind of lost our taste for the tangy um, acidic taste of ferments we've become so obsessed with sweet so it might take a little while for you to tune into this taste, but you will not regret doing so. So I'm just going to put in some lime juice. Oh, 
and I'm going to chop up some coriander. I think, as I understand it, some people, depending on their genetics, either love or utterly detest coriander, and it has a genetic basis to it. So I'm really sorry if you're one of those that despise coriander. I'm sure you could use parsley instead. I'm going to put a couple more tomatoes in there, I think. And then I'm going to put my garlic in. The smell is amazing. Now, the other thing I'd say with this ferment or with all ferments when you're starting out is I would recommend putting them on. Um, we're going to pack them into a kilner jar in a minute. And um, I would put the kilner jar on a plate because as those microbes take off, they do produce an impressive amount of carbon dioxide. And what we're, the environment that we're creating, we need to exclude oxygen. So it's an anaerobic environment. So the microbes that we want to thrive don't like oxygen and your sort of commoner garden molds and those sorts of things do. So that means we tend to like to fill the jar up to push out oxygen at the top. Um, and that means you have a reasonably full jar. So when carbon dioxide is produced, often the fluid is forced out the top. So you've got three cloves of garlic here, um, all over your lovely surface. So if you put it on a plate, that will catch all of that. So we're creating an anaerobic, so no oxygen, acidic environment. So that means things like botulism and the things that people tend to worry about do not thrive in this environment. Uh, we're making it perfect for the microbes that we want. There we go. So I'm going to just put a little bit of that lovely thyme in. Great respiratory support. It tastes delicious as well. And for anyone that wants the recipe, it is actually on my website, which is wondergut.com. So you can find the recipe there or buy Derbler's fantastic book. Okie dokie. So I've got 920 grams of veg. This honestly, oh, stick a bit of cumin in. If you like fennel instead, you can stick a bit of fennel in. This is just to my taste. So you need 2% salt. So if I've got 900 grams, say, of veg here, I'm going to need 18 grams of salt. Now, when you're starting out, I would recommend weighing the salt out in a different bowl because if you slip, you're going to have a lot of salt and then you have to add more veg or try and pick the salt out and it gets a bit messy. Um, so, 18 grams of salt. Now, in terms of weaving this into your life, there we go, so I've got 18 grams. I'll do this alongside making dinner. Actually, when you know what you're doing, it's pretty straightforward and you can do it very, very quickly. And then this will last months and months and months. So I've added the salt, 2% salt, and now I'm gonna massage the salt through the vegetables. And it is another one of those important things is um, to make sure the salt is well dispersed through the vegetables so that it um, can have that action on drawing out the fluid and um, deterring problematic bacteria evenly. Oh, it smells magic. So what we're trying to do, um, and with the tomato sauce, which happens really quickly, is get to a point where the fluid, when you squeeze it, can you see that fluid running there? So that will take a bit longer if you're fermenting sauerkraut, for example. But we need that fluid because we're going to pack this into that jar and make sh um, that fluid will rise to the top to block oxygen getting to the vegetables. So with cabbage, it takes a bit longer. Um, with sweet potato, you can do sweet potato ferments. Again, it takes a bit longer. I'll just literally, you can keep massaging or you can if you haven't quite got the juice coming out, just put the bowl to one side and let the salt do its work. So that happens very quickly with Miss Salsa, look at that. So we're now going to pack it into a kilner jar or kilner type jar. I use kilner jars because they've got the rubber 
edging, which allows the carbon dioxide to escape. People do use jam jars, but you do get issues with the lactic acid making the lid rust. And obviously, if you seal that top, there's nowhere for the carbon dioxide to go. So make sure you've got a jar where the carbon dioxide can escape. Now, this is my one piece of technology, a pickle packer, but you can use a flat ended rolling pin or just put it in with your fist. And what you're doing here, so you just, if you're just using your fist, you just push down like that. Obviously I've washed my hands. Um, what you're trying to do here is Push out air because we don't want air in here because the microbes that we aren't encouraging like air. And to push up the moisture, I don't know if you can see the moisture starting to rise up there. So can you see, I mean it is a bit squidgy but you can just see the fluid starting to rise to the top there and that is going to be our protection from mold and other things that we don't want to grow so it looks like i could have put a little bit more veg in to get right to the top there um, and that's the ideal is to come up probably to this level here just to exclude um, as much air from the kilner as you can so that's it some people will put um, like a very clean pebble or um, some people fill plastic bags with water to hold down their ferment. I don't want to put plastic in, con in contact with my ferment and I find that um, there's enough fluid within uh, even now to um, keep, them, uh, keep the vegetables under the fluids that have come out of them. So then I shut that up and I will put it on a plate and put it out at room temperature and watch. And what you will see um, in, uh, within three to four days, you will see bubbling. You might see fluid on your plate afterwards. And as I said, within four to five days, you can taste it and start eating it or leave it for longer. So just to recap, the key things that you need to be aware of is cutting the surface area of the vegetables small to allow the microbes access, 2% salt mixed in well, and then ensuring that those um, vegetables are pushed under the level of their fluid so you don't pack them in until the fluid's really, really running. And in that way, you've created an oxygen-free environment with plenty of surface area for the microbes to get going, um, to produce that lactic acid, to acidify the environment, to discourage the microbes that you don't want and create the haven for the microbes that you do. And along the way, what will affect how fast it goes is the amount of time that you leave it and the temperature in the room that you put it in. So if you've got a relatively cold house, then you might not see activity for seven or eight days. But if you um, live in a very warm house, then the activity, um, the fermentation will go much, much faster. So there it is. I really, really encourage you to experiment with this. It is the most fantastic fun, makes delicious food, is beneficial to your health. And uh, in a way, key to me is that reconnecting with our environment and our our place in the grander scheme of things. So not seeing microbes as our enemy, but a part of us, which I think is gonna be essential for our, our future on this planet. If you've got any questions coming out of this session, please do head to wondergut.com and email me through there and I'll be really happy to help with any questions that you may have. So enjoy yourselves and enjoy doing some fermenting.